Well, good afternoon. I will call to order the February 18th meeting of the Oklahoma City Riverfront Redevelopment Authority. First item is items from the chairman, and I don't have anything today. Uh, item three is the minutes. Any changes or corrections to the uh, January 21 minutes? Move approval. Second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Item four is a consent docket. We have an oil and gas revenue report and a river corridor events update. Any questions on either one of those? Move approval of both items. Ask your vote. Passes unanimously. Item five is the primary agenda items. Item A is to receive Oklahoma River Maintenance Projects update. Jim, you got something for us? Um, as you know or have noticed, we've drained the western basin down to where we can start dredging operations there. The contractor's gotten mobilized and has been building his road out to where he can start the heavy dredging operations. They've been doing a little bit of work cleaning up around the locks in those areas. Um, we have a budget of about $500,000 for dredging in that area to clear that up. Um, as far as our maintenance report, we picked up 0.3 tons of debris out of the basins. Uh, it was primarily Western Basin again. Is there any questions? Any questions for Jim? Motion to accept the report. Cast your vote. Pass the unanimous. Thank you. Thank Jim. you. Item B is to receive an update on the management and operations of the Oklahoma City Whitewater Center. Stephen, is that going to be you or Mike? Yes. Or both? Both. Hello, this is Mike Knopp with the Oklahoma City Boathouse Foundation. Um, we're pleased to give you a, a quarterly report of the operations of River Sport Rapids. This is something that we're doing now with City Council. Um, this is Councilman Stone Cipher and McAtee. You've heard some of this before. There's some new information too, and uh, Councilwoman Hammond. So I did I did make some updates from the from the presentation I gave about a month ago. Um, so I guess I got a point. <laughs> So, um, so we're going to give a quick year in review, a financial update, and then what we have in store for this year and uh, coming up. So, put that little sign up at the top right-hand corner because we are cel we did celebrate 20 years since I started coming to this river trust and talking about river development when things were still a ditch. It's hard to believe, and that was the original sign for the first uh, concept of a boathouse that happened uh, where the Chesapeake Boathouse stands today. So a lot has happened in 20 years, needless to say. So if we go on to the next slide. Um, I wanted to kind of emphasize in, 20, in 2019 within the Whitewater Center, we really say there's just been a, this collective impact. We're using that because of obviously with what we've been doing with the Outdoor Foundation grant that we've been working with, it's about collective impact. It's how we're using that opportunity to engage so many different groups uh, across Oklahoma City to experience uh, what we have to offer, which is truly unique in the world, and also how we can inspire an outdoor active culture among our youth. And so um, the, we had the 15th anniversary of the Oklahoma Regatta Festival, which again, a portion of that did take place within the Whitewater Center. We did a big uh, rafting championship that was among our corporate participants and um, uh, a youth, uh, program with uh, John Rex Elementary School that actually did cardboard boat racing so we're and that's actually formed the foundation of a new curriculum that's going out to Oklahoma City Public Schools that we're really excited about. We accelerated for America which is that picture there that is actually the mayor of LA rafting um, Eric Garci uh, Garcetti in Riversport Rapids uh, last uh, September August and then we've done several surfwater training events um, continues to grow. We've had several, a lot of commentary about how the training that has occurred in, in River Sport Rapids has really impacted, uh, and even a couple of them have attributed to, to lives in terms of what they've learned and how they've responded to swift water rescue incidents uh, around the state and really around the region. Um, we had several floating films of the music series, the White Water Festival, uh, which is, uh, and then um, the uh, a Paddle Sport Retailer Show, which is the bottom right-hand picture, uh, had people from all over the country here, uh, vendors and retailers, 
People just love the venue and, and truly, you know, it's, it's great to see the outdoor industry respond so favorably to Oklahoma City, really changing their perception. And we did uh, do an economic impact study last year that shows we, what we do with all of these events make about 23, over a $23 million economic impact on Oklahoma City. So moving on to the next page. So youth engagement, again, is a cornerstone to what we do. It's, you know, we're a you know, nonprofit. It's mission-based, and we touch lives directly with uh, 3,200 Oklahoma City youth through our outreach and thrive outside programming. I'd mentioned you can see that cardboard boat race on the top right-hand corner. Um, I went to, if you go to the next page, um, this happened actually just a couple weeks ago, to the Outdoor Retailer Show in Denver where we gave our first report for our engagement in the Outdoor Foundation's Thrive Outside initiative. I've mentioned before to you that we were selected as one of four cities in, the, in, in America to advance this program to infuse outdoor culture into Oklahoma City. What I came away from learning is that this is a program that they've been working on for a decade. And they had a map of the country, and they identified locations where they wanted to focus. And there was Oklahoma City in the middle, and they put color coding around other outdoor resources, and there was nothing that they had identified. They just didn't really think a lot of us. And then they came, and they were really surprised and really blown away by what they said. So they told me, they said, we took a risk in Oklahoma City, but you so far exceeded our expectations. and so. They said this program is planned to go into 50 cities in America, and they're really using this as a model, uh, us, San Diego, uh, Atlanta, and Grand Rapids. So again, I think it's a great opportunity. It's really changing perceptions about Oklahoma City, and we think there's a good platform to build upon. You'll hear a little bit about how that's going to form the basis of our fundraiser for 2020. And the next slide is youth participation in 2019. Um, we wanted to put some value to that, and so when you look at the total value of participation through our Thrive programs, through all of our youth leagues, we have about 15 Oklahoma City public schools, middle school, high schools that have rowing teams at no cost. So we provide that through grants and, and, and we provide the coaching and equipment. They're just now starting up. In fact, actually I want to say this, there, there is a winter league <laughs> and they're starting up. Uh, there's Next weekend is the... Uh, Barton Audio Sports Experience at the Cox Center. And so if you go down there on Saturday, you'll see a lot of kids on rowing machines racing. You'll see their boat on the screen. And so that's just something that they do before they get on the water. And we're going to have a lot of activity. This is, the program continues to grow. Uh, OKC Respond in the FACT program, we work, work with the police department on their youth uh, initiative to kind of work with juveniles and kind of provide leadership training and experiences. And then the Thrive, or the, the OKC Respond program also involves physical and mental health programming within the boathouse for our first responders, police, and fire. And then, um, so the total value is about $391,000, which is supported by several different groups, the Outdoor Foundation, Inasmuch, Kirkpatrick Family Fund, uh, Gaylord Foundation. Um, and I should update this, but we actually did a new total of all of the scholarships, and now it's up to $13 million in college scholarships that have been awarded to Oklahoma City youth for rowing to colleges across America. So this river, this former ditch, has created a lot of opportunities for kids in college. Let's move on to the next slide. This is the map that Thrive, uh, the Outdoor Foundation created that kind of represents all of our resources and our partners through this initiative and a picture from our urban camping day, which leads me to the next slide. I just want to mention, I think, I wanted to just share a really quick quote. It says, what I learned was that spending time outdoors is almost always a bonding experience, even in this urban setting. The kids had so, such a, the, much of the same positive experience that I strive for in the mountains. It doesn't need to have be a pristine wilderness in the darkness of night with a sky full of Milky Way. These kids soaked up the chilly downtown or outdoors and had a blast. The point is we can create an outdoor experience right in downtown Oklahoma City and this was the, out the coordinator of our outdoor club. So we think there's a really great, you know, really awesome opportunity moving forward. Going to move ahead with private events. Um, that's one of the great things about the Boathouse District is we have a lot of the events for other nonprofits that use our facilities for their fundraising events. So whether it be the, uh, the Lyric Theater, the, uh, the Light the Night event. Uh, we do a lot of weddings, too. And then uh, another example is the Oklahoma Book Festival that brought thousands of people down 
and we've been doing that the past couple of years. It takes up the whole venue. Moving on to the next slide, I wanted to mention social media. Um, it's hard to read that slide, but I just want to mention we have uh, nearly uh, about 77,000 Facebook followers, uh, total about 100,000 social media followers, and over 50,000 people that have subscribed to our email uh, list. So it's been very significant and dramatic growth over the last year, which obviously helps with our reach um, and augments our marketing and promotional efforts. Um, so with that, I'm going to bring up Stephen Ball, our Chief Operating Officer, who's going to go through the financial aspect of River Sport Adventures. Yeah, I'll go through this fairly quickly and try to answer any questions anyone might have. But we do have a new accounting system that was uh, put into place at the end of 2019, and we're already seeing some really um, useful um, results from the implementation, particularly in the project code ability now that the old system, QuickBooks, just couldn't provide for us. So. Uh, getting right into the comparative income statement, the next slide there, this is on uh, all foundation operations. Uh, total contributed support, uh, while did go down slightly in 2018, the note there did include the $2 million reimbursement of foundation expenses that was received from the city. Uh, while 2019 uh, earned income did grow over 2018, uh, but that does include the uh, $1.1 million new city management fee, which is needs-based. Um, that was in that began in 2019. So total revenue um, together is basically flat, although total operating expenses is down about seven percent, or five hundred and twenty thousand dollars. And most of that is in uh, savings in salaries and wages through um, eliminating and consolidating uh, full-time positions. The next slide is on earned revenue. Um, Pretty much every category uh, um, we saw some growth in. Merchandise sales, which includes food and beverage uh, in the Whitewater Center, private event rentals, uh, rental fees, adventure passes, uh, program fees. And then the last line management fees, uh, part of that is the uh, new city management fee, which is needs-based. The next slide is on programming. Um, Swiftwater training, and Mike talked about that. We think there's huge potential there to grow that even more uh, than what we uh, saw this year. Corporate program fees, um, there's been some decline over the years actually in, in corporate program. We think there's some opportunity there too with the great team building um, for corporate leagues. Uh, camp participants and camp program fees, you can see there's a really big increase. That's primarily that Thrive Outdoor Foundation uh, summer camp program that uh, we were able to um, partner with the Outdoor Foundation. Okay. Next slide is River Sport Adventures. Uh, this gets more into ad just adventures in, in particular, breaks out more of the retail, slight growth there in retail, and, and a little bit in food and beverage, uh, parking, team building. Uh, one day revenue, uh, we, we saw a slight increase, even though we saw a significant increase in season pass revenue. Usually when season pass revenue increases, your one day goes down, but um, we, we feel like there is continued area for growth there because um, of the opportunity, the value that a season pass um, has for the River Sport Adventures. And with the new surf we're coming in, it just adds all that more uh, value to the season pass to come back multiple times. So total season pass units, you see we had a really nice growth over 2018. And we, and we think because of the new surfer, we're, we're anticipating that to go up as well. Total rafters for 2019 were up 18 percent. So we, we rafted 18 percent more people in 2019 than we did in 2018. So a lot of that was because of the increased season pass because they come back multiple times. So a quick slide there on the management fee. Uh, approved was $1.5 million for fiscal year 1920. Paid through the end of 19. Uh, through December was actually 1152 uh, through uh, we just received the January payment. So we're at 1182 currently that we've received in that management fee, which again is, is needs-based. Okay, quickly on the budget, 2020 budget overview. Um, the next slide is the income. And we listed out the 2018 actuals, the 2019 unaudited uh, forecast, and then what we've targeted, what the board has approved, our board has approved of the 2020 um, budget. So charitable support, we, we anticipate going down a little because of the some of the grants and funding that we received in 2019, 
Uh, some of those are front loaded in year one and the following years are smaller. So we anticipated that in the budget. River sport revenue, we actually see an increase there of about 7%, um, primarily again driven by increased season pass sales and the, the new surfer. And then other income um, is um, in 29, so in, in the, the $2 million reimbursement in 18 is actually in that ch charitable support line in that 3.3 million. The 2019 management fee is in other income, just to clarify that. And then the, on the 2020 budget under other income, that does contemplate the possibility of renewing the management fee for fiscal year 2021. Okay, the next slide is the 2020 budgeted expenses, salaries and wages, and you see there this $278,000 reduction in 19 salaries and wages versus 18. And then we plan to uh, basically hold that flat with, with a few other cuts there in the 2020 budget. Um, utilities actually went down in 2019. Um, we had some savings in electrical and we anticipate possibly some additional savings in electrical for 2020 budget, but knowing the surfer could increase just slightly uh, the utilities there and then total other expenses. Um, and here, total other expenses does include debt service, so our interest payments um, are included in that as well. So you see the total net income there um, at the bottom. All right, and then the next slide, a quick debt overview. Our long-term debt is currently about $3.2 million. Um, and then age payables, um, as of January 16th of uh, this year was about 120,000 versus over 300,000 in 2019. Um, I'd like to give just a real quick update on operations on cleaning the Whitewater Channel because I know that's been a lot of topic of discussion and we are kind of down to the very end. We're finishing vacuuming the whole lower pond, doing a very thorough cleaning. We had to pull two of the pumps, those mass flow pumps, so we took advantage of when we pulled those pumps, we dropped the water to as far as we could safely drop the water without that hydrostatic pressure pushing up and having a bad day uh, at the at the river sport uh, if that pool were to come up out of the water. So we've dropped it as far as we possibly can to keep the weight on it, right? Um, and because of that, we're now able to go in and really clean, the, because we can see the bottom, really clean all of the mud and the muck that's accumulated over the years off the bottom. So we're hopeful that in phase two um, of the rivers of the uh, MAPS 3 surplus that, um, that that will have the additional filtration that we need for long term clarity on the water. Um, but we're we're seeing some really good success. And I specifically want to thank Jim Llewellyn and Doug Cupper and their staff for helping at least just soundboard ideas on on cleaning and vacuuming the, the, the lower pond. So any questions for me? All right, thank you. I guess the question I'd have is as far as the clarity issue is concerned, when will we see signs of success, or no success in the next two months, three months? Well, we're seeing signs right now because we can actually see the detail on the bottom of the concrete. So we're getting that dirt and that sludge up through the vacuuming. The real proof though is gonna be when we start putting the water back in. So we've drained almost 7.5 million gallons of water has been drained. When we put that water back in starting March 1st and we turn the pumps on, that's where the proof is in the pudding that yeah. it's worked. Thanks. So, yes. One critical part of that though, uh, I, Councilman, I did want to mention, the, we, had, we did drain the water in 20, after 2016. If you recall, when we opened the Whitewater Center, it was, you know, there, there had been no water in it. And then we had a lot of construction dust and things that went in there and when we opened it on opening day the water was brownish and so we actually drained the water down to about this level in 20, early 2017 I've got pictures and it and we filled it back up it was really pretty clear and it only took about a month and a half before it was back because of the just the dust and everything so that new filtration will hopefully address that issue you know more aggressively because of that Oklahoma red dirt that we deal with so um, I really quickly I just wanted to share with you uh, 
moving ahead with 2020 and our development initiatives. We do have our campaign that we've launched. We've already received a, a, a very nice contribution by the Ann Lacey Foundation of a quarter of a million dollars to help launch the initiative and um, have the uh, perfect finish event that we have coming up in two weeks, Champagne and Oysters, that supports our high performance program, all our event sponsorship. So there's a, there's a comprehensive package that we use to go promote and sell sponsorships or, or apply for grants. Um, if you move on to the next slide. So the goal is about three and a half million dollars that will um, help with, the, again, the incremental contributions and corporate sponsorships of about 1.775 new grants and then fundraising events, which will again help with that sustainability effort and, uh, and moving forward. But it is also important, again, the implementation of these MAPS-3, the surplus fund projects create new revenue streams with the surfer, the new event center, and, and the, they create na naming opportunities. And we do believe we're close to having a naming on the surfing machine, which is, is again, a benefit to the revenue picture. Can move on to the next. And that's the surfing venue. The, the, the pro there's a big hole right now, so we've progressed beyond this picture. Um, we expect that to be open in May. We actually have just re uh, committed, we have a world tour, uh, flow tour event that will be in early August, so it'll be bringing in competition so our kids will actually be able to train and surf at a competition in August. And then I want to talk a little bit about the master plan. If we go to the next slide, this is uh, uh, the, uh, Wade Scaramucci and his team have created a, a we call it 2.0. This is contemplating opportunities for the future of how we might integrate commercial development into the Boathouse District, uh, which we think is a very important part of the, the vision moving ahead. And how does it complement what we've created, creating a real robust, you know, taking this world-class differentiating venue that we have with Oklahoma City and make it better and uh, make it more of a year-round destination. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, so the first step in that is Barquet, and you've heard about this. This is, um, we're very pleased that this is the first project. We think it will add a lot of momentum and year-round activity. Um, really complements the outdoor lifestyle aspect that we're, we're building. Um, if you move, keep going through some, so this is an idea of what it will look like. It'll be on the, the, the uh, near I-35 at near the cul-de-sac on the northeast side of the venue. Um, and Kansas City location has been very, very popular. About 30,000 people in a month come to it uh, for everyone. And it's got a really good restaurant. So even if you don't have a dog, it's still a great place to go and hang out. They have a, you know, they spend a lot of time really making sure the food is great and the experience is great. And so you move on. So that gives you an idea of the layout. Um, they're hoping that uh, they will get this started here very, you know, soon. And with the idea that it opens in early 2021. And we believe this, the most important thing about this is we think this is a catalyst for other opportunities. We've already seen interest building some really real uh, viable other opportunities that are coming along. And the ideas of how we use this to leverage new past sales, comp complementing one another and the people coming down, uh, you know, their dogs are playing and doing adventures and the humans are too. And so we think there's some really great opportunity there if you go to the next. And then this is an idea of what this urban outdoor lifestyle village could look like, just a concept moving ahead with a vision of creating uh, opportunities for outdoor retailers or food and beverage and things like that, along with maybe some housing and um, other attractions, complementary type attractions. And then finally, our 2020 events, and that's not even a complete list now, it's just is we have a lot going on as we always do, but this year in particular, I had mentioned the Olympic trials, the marquee event, two, two rounds of that in early May. Um, and then one, last week we announced we're very, this is a huge opportunity for Oklahoma City and really the state that the International Canoe Fed Federation is gonna be bringing the new Super Cup event two weeks after the Tokyo Olympics. All the Olympic medalists in the sport of canoe kayak will come to Oklahoma City race for the first time ever in the sport under the lights because they can only do it here. I guess imagine that is what I'm supposed to say. You know, with the, it really goes along with the new state brand and the idea that we will have this broadcast live on NBC and, River, and, uh, and also Eurosport. And they expect about 10 million European viewers of this event. So. That will coincide with the USO Warrior Weekend, and they expect to have several thousand people down 
uh, celebrating our, our military and having wounded warrior programs, and that'll happen in August. Um, so you can move on to the next. So that's the Warrior Week. So there's a lot uh, in store for 2020. We're really excited about all of what is yet what is to come. So um, with that, um, if you, that's the Olympic trials, and we will send you more information on that. And uh, I appreciate time if there's any questions. Sorry, there's a lot to it. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. Uh, we need a motion to accept that report. Cast your vote. Pass it unanimously. Item C is to receive an update from Lost Lakes Development LLC on pr proposed zoning changes related to their area 3501 Northeast 10th. Roger, how are you doing? Good. Roger Skeen with Garrett Lost Skeen. Lakes, and this is Garrett Skeen. Um, we are doing PUD 1749. We went to pull a permit on uh, a piece of property, which on this map it's depicted as item six, track six. We found out at that time that we had a piece of property that was mistakenly put in PUD 1631, along with that piece of property and Another piece of property that we had, we didn't even own it. There were two pieces that were mistakenly put in the PUD. So we created this PUD to take track six, turn it back into residential, and then to take the track out of there that we didn't even own just to make it go away. In addition to that, we are adding the agricultural element for our property, just for the private property. Met with Councilman Nice back in December and uh, she was fine with everything we did on our private property, but she did not want the, uh, the rezoning changed to the, uh, the city property, the, the, the River Trust lease that we have. So PUD 1631 is going to remain the same. 1749 are just going to be the minor changes that we talked about. I have a quick question. So PUD 17, what is in the boundaries of PUD 1749 is specifically what's leased from the river the 1749 is our private property. Okay, and then? 1631 would remain the river property. Okay, okay, thank you. So there'll be no changes to River Trust property. Uh, this was just kind of information for us in case we had questions or comments on it. No changes. Any other questions? Okay. Motion to receive that update. <coughs> Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Item D is to receive the Riverfront Redevelopment Authority schedule of cash receipts and disbursements for the period ending December 31. Any questions on this? Your motion to receive. Second. Cast your vote. It passes unanimously. Item E is our audit contract between the River Trust and Allen Gibbs and Hollick LC for fiscal year 1920. This is the same group that did it last year, I believe. Any questions on it? Motion to, to uh, approve the audit, approve the contract. Cast your vote. Passed unanimously. Item F is to recommend the City Council adopt an ordinance relating to parks, recreation, cultural affairs, amending Section 38-93 of Division 1 of Article 4 of Chapter 38 of the Municipal Code 2010 as amended, <laughs> pertaining to animals generally. Uh, as I understand it, this pertains to feeding of animals on park property. Doug, is that a short description of it? Yes, sir. Uh, we're trying to curtail the feeding of wildlife in all of our park properties. And since we lease uh, quite a large track along the river to the River Trust, we thought it prudent that you also agree to these changes to our ordinances to, to outlaw the feeding of wildlife. Okay. Did we get a motion? Okay. 
I, I did have one quick question that's got nothing to do with the River Trust land. How does this pertain to feral cats? <laughs> Uh, uh, fer feral cats are excluded from the ordinances um, because of the working relationship that we have with uh, animal control and, and their quote unquote uh, cat wranglers and, and it is a city council authorized program to have um, colonies of feral cats that have been spaded and neutered uh, in certain locations. Uh, most of these are on actual water utility trust properties, not necessarily parklands or, or river trust, but they're excluded, um, and it's a controlled circumstances through animal control. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I have uh, sure. a bit more uh, explanation for this proposed ordinance. I know that we already have a motion on the table here, but... Uh, uh, Mr. Cupper, our Parks Director, has provided a, a great summary of it. Uh, nutshell, it's to prohibit the feeding of wildlife within city parks like reservations and the North Canadian River Corridor Recreation Area. Um, some people would ask why, we'd, why we would want to do that. Um, so we have a bit uh, more information. Uh, Heather, if we can go to the second slide there. While feeding life, wildlife is generally regarded as generally well-intentioned, there are negative consequences to doing so. And uh, the information on this slide is, uh, is from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, it's actually bad for wildlife. Uh, human food is not healthy for wild animals, and they don't need human uh, food from humans to survive and they can, become, they can become malnourished and die if fed the wrong foods. And uh, furthermore, animals cannot distinguish food from wrappers or foil and can get sick uh, eating those items. Uh, it can also lead to an overpopulation of wildlife and uh, additional public health concerns with uh, large concentrations of ducks and geese can result in uh, a lot of waste in uh, our city parks and along our river trails. Uh, it also interferes with animal behavior, can make animals more aggressive when they become more exposed to humans, and it interferes with their migratory patterns, which uh, results in a loss of biodiversity. And uh, it also creates additional hazards and nuisances. It's, it's dangerous for aviation, of course, and uh, Animals that are fed along roads tend to stay near roads, which increases the chance of uh, vehicle animal accidents. Um, and Heather, if we can go to that final slide. This is simply an informational uh, uh, poster provided by the USDA that is uh, commonplace throughout the US. And uh, so, so some of the reasons behind uh, this ordinance. And I uh, know that our council members are seeing this for the very first time, so happy to respond to any additional questions that you might have. Any other questions? I, I understand the need for it and agree with it. Enforcement is the biggest issue on it. It's kind of hard to stop mama from letting the kids feed the feed the ducks out there sometimes. But, uh, I have a motion. And it passes unanimously. Item G is a resolution accepting the annual inventory of the Oklahoma River Rowing and Canoe Kayak Race Course, including the city of Oklahoma City property that was obtained uh, by the Boathouse Foundation through a settlement, tobacco settlement, and then transferred to the city. This is an annual inventory that that they're required to give to us of the property. Any questions? Second. Ask your vote. It passes unanimously. Item uh, six is the claims docket. Any questions on the claims? Motion to approve it. Passes unanimously. Items of seven is additional items. 
Uh, Doug, anything in your report other than, I mean, other than what's written in there? No, sir. Um, we kind of a quiet month. We appreciate uh, your consideration of the report as filed. Any questions of Doug? Motion to receive that report. Let's prove you now. Thank you. Call any comments by trustees? Any citizens wanting to be heard? Very good. We are adjourned.